It is episode four of Light Minded uh, with myself, Christian Fletcher, Mr. Tony Hewitt, and also Lau, who's the um, Chief Visionary Officer for Phase One. Uh, how are you going there, boys? Hey. 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 What does a Chief Visionary Officer actually do? Well, I spent most of my time um, planning like, long term strategy, figuring out how our technology can fit with. Uh, requirements wishes from uh, from different types of photographers both in in uh, you can say normal photography and also in some of our industrial applications figuring out which kinds of technology we have to to push for in the future to to meet that sounds quite complicated I'm struggling to say the name. No, it's, 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 uh, visionary officer. No, no, oh, he's, no he's his last name. name. <laughs> la, la, no, yeah. Not go. Yeah, no, I just find it's good because you get a chance to uh, talk to somebody who's on one end, designing and developing the equipment. On the other end, listening to the people who are going to use it. Yeah. yeah. So I've been I've been on a development team for for twelve years and uh, part of developing most of our products in in that period. And now I'm um, still part of that. And then I spend a lot of time traveling, so getting feedback, bridging that feedback with what we can technically do, technically do, and figuring out where we have to go from here. The uh, hot question on everybody's lips is, how do we pronounce your surname? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so my my my. Uh, First name is Lau. My last name is Norgard, if you try to pronounce it with an English accent. In Danish, it would be Lau Nago. Right. Lau <laughs> Nago. Yeah. It's very short. He, he talks quite quite quickly. And, uh, you know, he's got good English, but it's, you know, better he makes mine. He, yeah, it's better than mine. Yeah, it's better than But he also does amazing things with, with cameras. So uh, Lau was uh, kind enough to come and visit Tony and I down here in the southwest, and he bought the new IQ4 150 megapixel digital mm. back from phase one. And uh, we've been out this morning having a bit of a play with that. And we're going to go out and do some more playing with it this afternoon and make some prints. But uh, the one thing that struck me this morning is that we we got a couple of the files up and one was a uh, from the 150, one was from the 100 megapixel. And we put the 100 megapixel file on top of the 150 megapixel file and it just made the 100 megapixel look like a little baby. Wow. It was it unbelievable how, how much resolution there. It's yeah. just mind-blowing. And it can re- really, really make huge prints. Yeah. But I think the most amazing is that that new 150 megapixel sensor, because it's a new generation of sensor, it's a backside illuminated uh, CMOS sensor. It's the first of that size that has ever been made. Um, the pixel level quality, even at 100%, is significantly better than the 100 yeah. Ring pixel, even if even though it has fifty percent more pixels, so that's, I think that's a, quite an achievement. Yeah, Matt. Now, can I ask you who is this back um, targeted towards? So we've made it for a number of different types of photographers, um, for commercial advertising, um, product photography, and we also make it for uh, for fine art, landscape, architecture. Um, then we use the same technology in a different form factor for industrial photography, and mainly aerial photography. So mm. anybody flying maps, flying aircraft and making maps or 3D models of cities. And also we, um, we have a lot of users in the uh, museum and archive community, uh, digitizing and preserving, like, well, the heritage of the, the human race. Where is it going from here? I mean, 150 megapixels, like... <laughs> Is there any progression left? This is where you can say yeah. to infinity and... <laughs> well, we, we call it the infinity platform. So the, the simple thing would be, there will be a beyond, of course. Um, wow. Resolution, some would claim that 150 would be enough. It might be. But uh, once you start editing, having resolution headroom, having the, the headroom to do cropping, to do any geometric changes to your images, actually helps quite a bit. And for somebody making very large fine art prints, of course, more resolution is, is always awesome. But we are not just about more pixels. I think a lot is happening both with the quality of the pixels, but but we're also pushing to uh, to add more things than just resolution. So new ways of using the sensors to create images that are essentially new and revolutionary in other ways than just resolution. We're testing some of that actually now. I can't talk too much about it because it's still uh, unreleased. But uh, you, you one can. of we my won't, won't uh, tell anybody. Yes, you can this tell trip us. is actually together with uh, with Christian and Tony here to mm. test some new and upcoming firmware updates where we have some features that are based essentially on a combination of this fantastic sensor and then all the processing horsepower we put into the diesel bag around it. 
If, can I just say, to simplify it, Lau, if you can maybe ex uh, explain and expand on the idea of dynamic range and uh, cleaner ISO use, because that's something a lot of the, the listeners would probably click onto. So the sensor itself has a very, uh, very low noise. So uh, that means that higher ISOs are um, very usable, even though the pixels are smaller. Um, and all the dynamic, also the dynamic range, because of that very low noise, becomes at least it feels bigger. You can use it like further into the shadows. Mm. Um, so the sensor itself is really amazing. But what we are now pushing for and testing now is a feature where you can essentially continuously read out the sensor and combine that outside the sensor and software. So you can make dynamic range that becomes bigger than what the physical sensor can do itself. So back to your question about what comes next. I think that Features like that, combining multiple exposures, that is a lot of where we are going. We have the same with the focus stacking, where we take a number of, of shots and move the focus distance mm. and combine that, that, that all of that back into uh, to one image in, in software. So you can actually mm -hmm. focus stack inside the, the camera? Yes. Yeah. You do the actual combination of the files and software afterwards. It gives you much more flexibility, but the camera itself drives that. It calculates how many images to take in your stack and all of that, yes. Yeah. Now, uh, Christian and Tony, you guys have been out um, shooting with that over the last couple of days. What are your impressions? Well, I, 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 this is going to cost me a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first impression. But, oh, shit. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> so, yeah, no, uh, look, it's it's just that, that next level again. I mean, I'm, I'm shooting with the IQ280 at the moment, and that's a couple of generations back now from, from where they are. And, and just looking at uh, the interface and how it works and the, the extra features that are on there, it, it makes me realise that, yeah, it's time to do some upgrading. Yeah, I think also as professionals and, you know, having the opportunity to stay ahead of what the, the general population might be using and having in their hands in terms of, you know, lower-end cameras. Um, obviously, uh, phone cameras are pretty strong, mm. but phone cameras have limits and mm. so does DSLRs. Etc. So, seeing where this technology is going um, it is exciting. But I think the thing that starts to hit you is there are ideas that come into your head as a creative professional mm. or a professional creative. I'm not sure which comes first. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens is as you start to think about the technology, and we've already found this this morning sitting over breakfast, you start to go, oh, what if we do this with it? And what if we do that mm. with it? And these are ideas that weren't around before because you couldn't do it. Mm. So the, the the beautiful thing about that is that, you know, we're looking at a technology that's opening up new frontiers that we as professionals, we as leading creatives can actually explore and take other people behind us. And that's where phase one leads the, leads the game. Tony, would you mind expanding on that? Often we talk about, um, and if I step outside of cameras for a moment, I remember uh, quite a few years ago, someone saying to me that, ch that, that the students entering the first year of university in, in a science degree will be um, studying technology in their final year that doesn't exist yet. So if we just take that, that concept, we're looking at cameras now that are opening up ideas visually, which is probably now brings us back to Lau's um, title as a, what was it? Visionary. Uh, Chief visionary Chief officer. Chief visionary yeah. officer. So. <laughs> I'm starting to understand why that title exists now because mm. we look at it and we were playing around with the camera and we were starting to take ideas that the camera technology is um, opening up and connecting them in ways that haven't been connected before because you couldn't. Mm. The ideas didn't exist before because the technology wasn't there for it to even be considered. And as you go from one step to the next step, we start to see further ahead. We start to conceive creative ideas that we could not conceive before because they just weren't in the realm of possibility. Mm. And and that's where I think that people like, you know, Christian and myself, Peter Eastway's had a, had a little look at the technology mm. in the last week as well. And I'm sure other leading photographers around the world are doing the same. They will start to come up with ideas that then get fed back to people at phase one through, you know, obviously through yeah. their chief visionary officer in Laos that they will look at it and go, well, okay, we can do that. And what about if we bring this new facet of technology in, uh, into the game as well? What could you do with that? So it's like this mm. feedback loop that keeps building on itself. Mm. And we'll find ourselves producing things next year and the year after that we probably aren't even conceiving yet because they weren't possible mm. um, mm. and very, you know, very short time ago. And that's what the new technology allows you to do. I think that's where I feel quite privileged, being able to travel and 
show these things to you guys and others and uh, see what you can what you can do with it. Yeah. Uh, and in that way, we can we can bring together uh, your art and craftsmanship yeah. and uh, and our technology and make ho- I hope make both things yeah even better. So, like, if you take one one of the features on the XF camera system is the um, vibration delay switch, which uses seismographic technology, correct? Mm-hmm. And at first it was a, you know, you could dial in up to a four-second delay mm. and then it was a, an eight-second delay and now, and, and, you know, they brought in not that long ago an infinite delay. So you can press the trigger and the camera will not take an image until the vibration reaches a minimal level, whatever you set that at. Now, that technology wasn't around not that long ago. You just have to hope you don't get camera shake. Whereas now you could walk away and leave it there for, you know, mm. technically speaking, an hour or two, and it won't take a photograph until it's absolutely still. So you won't get any, you know, those sort of wow. ideas and that that opportunity opens up other other opportunities as well. So and so it's opportunity shots. built on opportunity built on opportunity, mm. which are built on technology technology advancements mm. that people like Lau are bringing bringing to professionals like ourselves. And what we need now is is a. Um, a feature where you point the camera at something and the, and the button won't fire unless it's a really good composition. That's one I'm looking for. <laughs> I need that. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. You just you just search around and it has AI, artificial intelligence, and knows and it has all. Well, the hang on a minute, co- you're doing yourself out of a job. Man. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Lau, can you make oh, that happen, please, anyway. mate? Can you make that happen, Lau? Maybe. When you think about it, it probably is possible. Who, who should be the judge of if it's a really good picture? Well, you and, is get, that, and is that static over time? Yeah, well, look, no, it'd be, I'll be the judge. It'd, it'd, be the, it'd be the Christian Fletcher feature. Or it could be that, that it just detects, I can see you try to take a photo of Sugar Loaf Rock. Rock. Yeah. We have a nicer one here. Would like to buy it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just got a little error message on the back. Sorry, this photo's been taken. You can yes. purchase your copy at christianfletcher.com.au. Yeah. Uh, Christian, out and about with the, um, with the back, what, what did you think about it? Uh, I, like I said, it's, I think it's amazing. I think it's uh, it makes me realise that I, I need to upgrade. But the one thing that struck me straight up was that having that much resolution, people go, oh, well, 150 megapixels, that's crazy. I mean, most people only make a, a 20 by 30 inch print at most. So, But then I thought, well, okay, 150 megapixels, I can crop and I, can sti- I don't have to stitch anymore. I can do all that stuff. I can create any shape. Any format photo I want, I can make it a two to one. If I mean, if I get wide enough back, I can, you know, I can make a square. I can make a panoramic, and and I don't have to worry about resolution. I don't have to worry about putting any extras together. So for me, that's a big thing. I, I like that that the fact of, of being able to do that. Um, but um, I think uh, what the the um, the DSLRs, all the uh, the small uh, mirrorless cameras, all that sort of stuff. That it makes you a little bit lazy when you get a camera system that's really uh, light, easy to use. I mean, okay, it's a great creative tool, but um, I, I only make my best work when I'm shooting with my Phase One because it it forces me to slow down and think about the subject, think about what I'm doing, and and ultimately I, I look at those files from you know for the Phase One I've got and I've been using for ten odd years. Mm. It it, it, this, it, they, there's something special about those files. There's something that you can't replace with any other camera. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think it's too easy to go down the, the road of, oh, I, I just pull it out, hand hold, and, and get, a, get a quick shot that's mm. not necessarily the, if you have the best technique, but, you know, near enough is good enough. But I think for, uh, like Tony said, like leading professionals, you want to have the best equipment and create prints that really mean something and, and are valuable. And, and and having that best equipment is is the way to go. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to bet to explore more with the IQ4 and, and see what it can do. You also talked about that you've had your existing phase one for a very long time. Yeah. We try to make equipment that, that lasts. So yeah. with the IQ4, we did everything we could to put as much processing power into it as possible so that over the next many years, we can keep on expanding that existing digital bag with new software updates, new firmware updates without ag- actually having to sell you a new physical unit. Yeah. We yeah. just want to keep it alive for as long as possible so we can get feedback, invent new stuff, and just send it out as firmware updates. Yeah, yeah. And look, and literally, my, my IQ 280, I've, I've been shooting with that for, I don't know, maybe, how long has it been out? Four years, probably four mm. years. And it hasn't missed a beat. And and seriously, those files are as good as, as anything. And um, you know, as a professional, uh, you know, when I when I was uh, shooting film, 
I was spending a hundred thousand dollars a year on film and processing, mm-hmm. and 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 what happens? The, the digital cameras came out, and things got cheap, and all of a sudden you weren't paying for film or processing and any of that sort of stuff. But we forgot about what it used to cost us to be a professional in the early days, and uh, so. You know, an investment in a in a phase one camera system isn't out of the question. I'm I'm sure there's a a lot of plumbers and and carpenters out there that have got a hundred thousand dollars worth of saws and drills and bits and bobs and yeah, trailers yeah. and four drives to tow. To, yeah, it's as a as a business tool, it's 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 you know it's pretty reasonable. So yeah, one of the, one of the things that I when I think about what we saw the last few days with this back is that it reminds me that. As a creative, you you need to have passion, you need to have imagination, but it's got to be matched by technology and technological uh, evolving. And that's where phase one, I think, probably in the field because they're continuously looking at the professionals uh, who are working at that cutting edge saying, well, what are you imagining and where are you coming up against the limits? Mm-hmm. And then they go away and engineers like Lau and his team will go away and look at those limits and think, how do we extend those limits? Okay, Lau, we got some uh, voiceovers made up during the week, and these were made by friends of mine, and they're not pros, but we um, we try pretty hard. So listen to this, mate. Time for the top three tips, to be sure, to be oh, sure. You could say that again, mate. We just couldn't understand your accent. Time for the top three tips. <laughs> there you go, Lau. Um, we need a Danish. <laughs> I reckon you should get, get Lau to do that for you. I, I could do one in Danish. <laughs> oh, could you? Yeah. Mate, we need the, um, the top three tips of shooting in medium format. Well, we, uh, I reckon we could work this out between the three of us, but I think the, the, the one important one is uh, getting a camera that can actually shoots in 16-bit. And uh, why is that important? Well, if you, if you make a kind of a true, true 16-bit file, you have a bit more headroom, you, uh, you have more, uh, more, less, uh, more smooth gradations, you have uh, essentially more numbers to choose from. Going from complete dark to the to the to the highlights, mm. so um, it ends up essentially giving a smoother file with a, with a, the possibility of a bit more dynamic range, but especially around the, the gradations, you, you you get a higher quality. So you're using a lot more information than an eight bit. Yeah. It essentially can can store four times as much uh, much information per pixel. Yeah. And what's another tip, oh, Tony? I was going to say, um, you know, when you're exposing, everybody understands you know, that little picture on the back of their camera, the histogram. Expose to the right, try and capture as much highlight detail as you can and just go as far as you can to the right without clipping where you lose information off the right. Um, why does that make a big difference, Lau? Mm-hmm. Well, because if you if you don't expose to the right, so you have kind of a little bit of empty space up there, then you don't use the whole range of, uh, of uh, possible values of, in your pixels. Mm. And actually, in in uh, in the highlight end, there are much more little steps between the numbers. So by by pushing your histogram to the right, you get you get a better sampling on the digital side. You also essentially have more light in the pixel, which means that when doing the conversion, you have better statistics. You get less noise. Pulling it down a bit afterwards doesn't hurt at all. The other way around, if you pull anything up, you also put the, pull the noise up. Mm. So always expose as much as possible. Which essentially means that the lower ISO you can you can work with, the cleaner, as low ISO as possible, and exposed as far as right as pos- to the right as possible, so you capture more light. Yeah. If you capture more light, you have more data, and you get less noise. Yeah. And when we say clipping, what are we? we... And essentially, clipping is once you get beyond that point. So you have to drive as close to the clip as possible. But if you fall over, it's just done. It's, go- it's gone. <laughs> yeah. And cl- clipping is the point where where you expose so much that the pixel saturates and you cannot see the difference between a full pixel and a full pixel that has, has overflow. Right. Yeah. So you just have flat white areas with no structure that you cannot recover in any way. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. And that's interesting when we're out there with the phase and I didn't even realize that you, uh, you've you got the different colors for the clipping. You can set your clipping mask to be showing it at uh, 250, um, but then if it goes, so that shows up red on the, on the screen at the back. If you go beyond that, it goes to purple, and I, and I didn't realize. So essentially, it has a, it's a has a highlight warning mask. It just mm-hmm. warns you that this highlight is getting close to the edge. It has a clipping mask that says this area is burned out. It's gone. Yeah. And you can use the highlight warning to kind of gauge where you are, and the clipping is kind of the hard stop. Yeah. Ne- never go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. And of course, the, the other I was gonna thing say, that, focus stacking, mate. That's yeah, your forte. Well, yeah, well, focus stacking I mean, with medium format, it's 
pretty essential to if you want to get that nice sharpness from the front to the back of the image important to to focus stack and now with the phase one you can do that in camera and do it for you uh, i i choose to do it manually because i find that quicker for me and i'll take about five shots so i i look through my viewfinder and i focus at my feet you could do that with live view obviously focus at my feet take that shot and then i just move the focusing ring as many times as i can uh until i get to a point where i'm in at infinity mm. uh, take that last shot and then um then i combine those shots together in uh, Helicon Focus is what I use. But with the XF camera, we've, we've actually built that in in an automated way. So you focus on the near point, click one button, focus on the far point, click another button, and either you can set the number of steps you want, or we've built in an algorithm that based on a model of the lens and the pixel size it and changes. the aperture, it'll just calculate how many stops should you do to make sure that this just works. Yeah. Well, I think when we're out there today, mm -hmm. something I need you to teach me how to we'll do that. We'll go play with it. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. And then it outputs it as layers. In a, so then uh, the, the uh, XF system will output them as layers? Yes, it will save all of these steps as individual raw files, but they will be tagged as number five out of a sequence of 12 or yeah. Yeah. whatever. And, and, and in Capture One, you, you can, can see them. them as a group. You can process them out, round trip to Helicon Focus, and have them uh, combined. So they have, the, they have the same file number? Yeah. With the so same they'll have the consecutive numbers, but they will have a little label inside telling that I am part of a stack. Yeah. Yeah. Now, can I just ask if, um, just a couple of questions. Uh, first one, the obvious one is, mate, can you just give me one? Can you give me one? He, he's shaking no. his head. For those <laughs> 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 we already asked. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, he doesn't talk about that. He, no. he, he's, uh, that's not his department. I'm, I'm not involved in that. He didn't even try and change his subject. He just, he just shook his head. Uh, the, the second one is, if we want to find out more information, what's the, the website address? Phase1.com. Phase1. That's easy. And just, uh, just and that's search for Yeah. Yeah. So it's P-H-A-S-E-1. And how would you say that in Danish? Well, it's an English word, so I wouldn't really say <laughs> just, uh, just say quickly. Fix my <laughs> something. <laughs> One piece. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, we always like to um, pick on people's uh, accents when uh, they when they come into this podcast, Carmen. We, we need a we German. Have... We need a German. They, they, they're fun to uh, to pick on. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a little list of uh, words in Danish that are difficult to pronounce. We can go through that afterwards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, uh, What's thanks. the most difficult one? I think the, the classic one we always... Uh, Get people to pronounce as rød grød med fløde på. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> what does that mean? Like that. No that's worries. a dessert. It's a dessert made of uh, red berries and you serve it with cream. Yeah. Say it again. Rød grød med fløde på. Oh, Tony. Sorry. 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 That's not bad, Tony. I, I couldn't even attempt that. <laughs> Tony, Tony Carl, yeah, you're, the, you're, you're the guy with the golden tonsils. So you should be able to come up with that one. Uh, Ort Mort Medina. That was <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not bad, not bad. Pretty good. Yeah. Now, um, thanks very much for uh, for joining us today, mate. And if you want to check us out on Instagram, just uh, enter Light Minded Podcast. Light Minded Podcast. Again, Lau, um, thanks for joining us today, mate. And um, you know, we can't wait to uh, to see more of this IQ four.